Hey guys, Sam International Master Andrei Ostrovsky, and you're welcome to the course dedicated to Queen's Gambit, one of the uh, most interesting openings in chess, the old one, classic one, which has a huge history behind it. Uh, in this video, we're going to discuss basic ideas and plans to get a better sensation of what this opening is. So the Queen's Gambit starts after move d4, black responds with a d5, and white plays c4, immediately undermining the central d5 pawn. So what is the idea behind this move? Uh, as we may notice, white is fighting in a very ambitious way for central squares. It's clear that e5 square is controlled already, but there is a fight for e4 square, and white tries to get rid of d5 pawn to get a better control over e4 square. That's the point. So black has a choice here between taking on c4 or maybe protecting the d5. Sometimes black even ignores the threat of taking on d5 and plays a peace move like knight to c6, let's say, but it's a minor line. So major continuations are d takes c4 and e6. And there are two different concepts here, because if black, for example, captures on c4, uh, black sort of agrees that uh, white will have a better control over the center. Uh, indeed, white has no problems with playing e4, even the next move. Uh, but black will try to use uh, the new opportunities that arise after d takes c4 to counterattack. So what has changed after d takes c4? The d-file became open and black can, for example, exert some pressure on white's central d4 pawn, maybe undermining it a bit later. If black decides to protect the pawn on d5 with moves like c6 or e6, let's say e6, then there is no problem with the d5 pawn anymore, but there is a problem with the bishop. So as you may notice, just like in French defense, when black plays e6, bishop c8 becomes quite limited. And it's a major problem for uh, this classic queen's gambit declined. So the center remains quite solid. d5 is protected, sometimes even overprotected, but the bishop is struggling to find an active position. No surprises that in this case, uh, black is trying to activate this bishop uh, by finding another uh, possibility to develop it, like after playing b6 or bishop b7. Uh, sometimes uh, it's possible to undermine the center, to open it a bit, and then to play something like e6, e5, well, just later on, all right? And then the bishop gets some opportunities on this initial diagonal. Uh, and uh, what is trying to do what? Just to continue with the development, for example, the uh, topical uh, lines uh, start with knight to c3 move. Uh, white keeps on exerting pressure on d5 pawn, at the same time controlling e4 square, maybe intending to play e4. Black is doing something like knight to f6 to control e4 and to protect d5 pawn again. And there is a fight around central squares, uh, black, of course, is trying to simplify the things by undermining the center a bit later with the c7, c5 move, and so forth. Uh, let's get back to Queen's Gambit uh, accepted. So, if black decides to take on c4, uh, obviously there are uh, different opportunities for both sides to uh, play in the center on the queen side. Uh, king side is mainly abandoned, so everything is happening exactly in the center and on the queen side. Um, so here, uh, since there is no longer a pawn on d5, white has a chance to occupy the center. White may do it uh, immediately after playing e4. White can also delay this move and start with, say, knight to f3 move, additionally protecting d4 pawn and controlling e5 square, and then play e4 or e3 even. And black is trying to undermine the d4 pawn. Uh, since there is no central pawn on d5 anymore, so, um, in general terms, black has just uh, given up the center. Uh, the natural plan is to undermine white's central pawn uh, to get rid of white's uh, center. That's the point here. Uh, so, black is trying to prepare either e7, e5, which is not that simple when the knight is on f3, or c7, c5, which is much easier to implement. Um, just to exchange white's d4 pawn. In this case, in the vast majority of cases, we deal with the uh, isolated pawn pattern, uh, especially if white uh, chooses to play lines with e3, not e4. So um, 
Something like c5 happens, then the exchange on d4, white recaptures with the pawn, and we deal with the isolated queen pawn pattern, which is quite interesting because uh, at first glance it's just a weakness, but uh, in fact it gives white some great attacking possibilities because the position becomes really open. Uh, black is obviously trying to blockade that pawn and um, use it as a weakness later on in the endgame. Uh, there are also different possibilities for black to protect the c4 pawn, but normally they don't work quite well. For example, if white plays e3 attacking the pawn on c4, uh, well, the natural reaction uh, is something like b7, b5, just to keep the extra pawn. But in that case, white has uh, different possibilities to undermine these pawns on the queen side immediately, for example, by playing a4 here. And in the nearest future, black's pawns on the queen side will be completely destroyed, uh, and hence white will get a much better pawn structure. For example, if black captures the pawn on a4, it's clear that black's pawns are not healthy here and white can just grab them one by one. Starting with probably c4 because it is the most important pawn and with the help of bishop c4, white also develops the bishop. And then taking that a4 if it is even needed a bit later. Um, you may ask what happens if black protects the pawn on b5 in this case. Well, it appears it's not so simple because if black plays a6, then the rook is hanging on a8, so white can simply capture the pawn on b5, and black cannot recapture because of the hanging rook. And if black plays, for example, something like c6, then uh, after a takes b5 and c takes b5, everything looks nice, uh, but if you look at this position carefully, you will notice that diagonal h1, a8 is weakened, and white can win the material after queen to f3, so it's impossible to protect the rook. So in general, I would say that, um, well, there are different tries for black in different lines to keep the extra pawn in Queen's Gambit accepted, but they don't work well. So normal plan for black in Queen's Gambit accepted is to focus on undermining uh, the center. So after e3 move, for example, it's possible to do with the help of e5 or maybe c5. And uh, after the exchange on d4, there will be uh, a isolated pawn that black is going to use as a weakness to attack. Okay, now let's get back again to the queen's gambit declines. Uh, in this situation, after e6, let's say knight to c3, knight to f6, and natural development like bishop to g5, as we may notice, the fight for central squares d5 and e4 continues here because white uh, pins the knight f6 and this knight is actually the main fighter, the main defender of the e4 square, as well as d5. So black normally decides to uh, deal with this pin immediately by playing bishop to e7. And after natural moves like e3, castling, let's say knight to f3, uh, we may notice that white starts developing his king side. Uh, black has to do the same with the queen side, obviously. But in general, what we can see here is that white has um, a serious presence in the center here, so it looks like what is kind of having extra pawn in the center. It is mainly because of the c4 pawn. So uh, black may put the pawn on c5 as well uh, to replicate white's activity, uh, but it's usually not so good. So for instance, if black does that, uh, there is always a nice possibility for white to force uh, very beneficial changes of the pawn structure in the center. So c takes d5, let's say e takes d5, and then white captures on c5, leaving black with the isolated pawn. In this particular case, this may even lead to material gainings, uh, but it's not the uh, correct line, of course. If we go back a bit to the uh, beginning of the game, uh, black has a possibility actually to uh, play this c5 a bit earlier, not to lose the material, uh, but it leads to the same thing. So uh, the isolated pawn appears on the board and white can use it as a weakness. So after d4, d5, c4, e6, knight to c3, there is a so-called Tarish defense which starts after c5 move. This opening line used to be very popular. It was even played by Garry Kasparov and he uh, heavily contributed to the theory of this line. But nowadays it is considered not very good for black because white managed to find good ways to deal with the isolated pawn actually uh, 
reducing opponent's chances to get active play. So after c takes d5, let's say e takes d5, either immediate capture on c5 or after some preparation, let's say after knight to f3 move, uh, leads almost inevitably to the position with isolated pawn on d5. So you may ask, what's the difference then? We have discussed that in Queen's Gambit accepted, white gets the isolated pawn. Isn't it the same weakness? Isn't it the same opportunity for black band to get very active setup and continue with the attack? Well, it appears that uh, white's uh, initial advantage of having the extra tempo right from the start plays a great role here uh, because white, uh, you know, gets much better options of developing the pieces uh, on the right squares so that uh, d5 pawn will be safely blockaded and the activity of black in the center, uh, especially on the e4 square, will be prevented. So uh, normally white tries to develop the bishop on g2 square. For that reason, um, white plays this fanchetto, g3, bishop, g2, to get the additional pressure on d5, and black is uh, normally suffering. So to avoid all this, and to play c5 anyway, because it is so natural to uh, add this pawn uh, to the center to fight for the central squares, just like white does after playing c4. Black delays this move and tries to play it only when everything is well prepared. So, for example, after knight f6, bishop g5, bishop e7, uh, let's say e3 move, something like h6, bishop h4, castling, knight goes to f3. Uh, Black starts developing his pieces on the queen side, uh, starting with the b6 move, let's say, just to have this nice b7 square for the bishop, activating it a bit, overprotecting d5, and also preparing c5. So that's the point here. Whenever Black plays c5 after b6, there will be no isolated pawn because Black is going to recapture with the pawn. But we will deal with another typical pattern here. Uh, let's make several moves just to show you the idea. Let's say bishop d3, bishop goes to b7, white castles, black develops the knight to d7. Uh, now it's time for white to think of what to do with heavy pieces. Let's say queen goes to e2, preparing the nice development of rooks to the d and c files. And here black plays on like c5. So that is what I was talking about. If now white tries to change the pawn structure in the center, let's say takes on d5, Black recaptures with a pawn, although it's not forced, taking on d5 with the knight is also possible. And if white decides to take on c5, black recaptures with a pawn. Here it's logical, because if you take with a piece, uh, you get the isolated pawn and give your opponent very nice spot on d4 uh, to blockade the things. But with pawn on c5, as you may notice, you control a lot of squares in the center, and not only in the center, uh, you have some dynamic uh, possibilities to push this pawns. Uh, later on, you may consider playing something like d4. Um, within this pawn structure, playing something like c4 is not recommended, because in that case you lose a control over d4 square and white will have a nice blockading uh, position for the knight or literally any other piece. Uh, that's why uh, white is sometimes trying to force c5, c4 by just attacking this pawn with his pieces or even preparing something like a3 and b4, undermining the pawn, and then in case of exchange or c4, well, this d4 square becomes possible to occupy. For black, in this situation, typical plans are just to develop pieces in nice positions, um, taking care of these pawns, because as you may notice, they are placed on open files, so they are uh, literally targets for white, and then when everything is ready to try to play d5, d4. So this is the main plan for black here, but uh, I don't want to say that it's so simple to implement. So as you may notice, uh, in Queen's Gambit accepted and Queen's Gambit declined, uh, we deal with uh, very interesting positions. And uh, in many cases, uh, they are positions with isolated pawns or so-called hanging pawns. So d5 and c5 in this particular case are called hanging pawns. So they are not necessarily hanging, uh, but at some point they may, because white will play something like rook to d1, another rook to c1, and uh, will just try to attack these pawns d5 and c5. So both patterns, I mean, positions with isolated pawns, positions with hanging pawns are classic strategic patterns 
So by learning Queen's Gambit accepted and Queen's Gambit declined by playing this opening with black and white pieces, you actually learn um, most important, I would say, most important patterns, strategic patterns of the middle game. If you learn how to play these positions, you will be perfectly prepared for playing these uh, patterns that may arise from any other opening. That's why it is so beneficial to learn Queen's Gambit. That's why we have prepared this course. And that's why I think uh, you will get a lot of benefits uh, from completing this course, not only from a theoretical point of view, but also from a strategic point of view. So in the next video, we'll start with the Queen's Gambit accepted and we'll have a closer look at what is going on there. So there are different opportunities, obviously, for both sides. And uh, what we're going to look at uh, in the next video will be main lines without knight to f3. So what does it mean? I will just show you in a second. So after d4, d5, c4, d takes c4, White has a choice. So between playing, for example, e4, e3, attacking the pawn on c4, or something else, or to play knight to f3 first to protect d4 and control e5 square. So in the next video, we will be mainly focusing on moves like e4 and e3. So let's dive in.